Yo, what up? Josh Rubin from East West Selling Performance. Today I want to talk to you about the foot again. And I want to talk about the subtalar joint, which is the talus, where your tibia kind of meets your ankle, and the calcaneus, which is basically your heel. Now, this is your subtalar joint. Now, I've talked about the many joints of the foot before, from the talocrural joint, tib, fib, and talus. Um, you have the Liz Franks joint, Chopard's joint, etc. This joint's pretty interesting because it's actually quite important because it's loaded with interosseous ligaments, the talococcaneal ligaments. It's loaded with posterior calcocaneal ligaments, lateral talococaneal ligaments, sinus tarsi that help us maintain stability, um, increase proprioception, and so forth. So it's a very important joint. Now the talus actually has no muscular attachments, but this joint is very important when it comes to um, proprioception of the foot and making sure that vertical forces are actually transmitted into horizontal forces. So potential energy, or I should say kinetic energy, turned into potential energy for walking, structural, balance, sensorial, fluidity of, of how we move every day vertical in space. And I want to talk about inversion of the foot ankle sprains today. But this joint's really interesting because it has three axes. So the, the, cal the talus and the calcaneus actually move in opposition when it comes to the PRM of the body. And the talus is typically fixed and move, uh, on the calcaneus. The calcaneus actually moves on it. So anytime we have what's called the PRM in the body, primary respiratory mechanism, the calcaneus actually moves anterior along the oblique AP axis. It actually moves laterally according to the uh, posterior aspect of the calcaneus. Um, and that's along the vertical axis. And then along the more just AP axis, it'll actually externally rotate. So it goes anterior, laterally, externally rotate. And the talus will actually go posterior along that same oblique AP axis. It'll actually um, laterally rotate as well, but it's actually named for the anterior aspect of the talus. And it'll actually anteriorly rotate, or internally rotate, sorry, along that AP axis. Now they do the opposite on exhalation of the PRM. And that's the normal mechanisms or mechanics of the joint. Now, let's say we have an inversion sprain. I want to show you how an inversion sprain in general, I'm not saying this is exactly what's going to happen, can affect the entire body from the foot all the way up to the cranium. Now, inversion in itself, now moving around the subtalar joint actually happens around Henke's axis through the head of the talus. And it's more of a medial, superior um, kind of axis that goes posterior through the joint in an oblique angle. It's called Henke's axis. It goes more posterior, lateral, and inferior. And that's where most movement happens around this joint. And this is where we get basically inversion and eversion in the foot. And I've talked about how we get dorsiflexion and plantar flexion only at the talocrural joint. So if we get an inversion sprain, inversion is when the foot does this. Inversion is adduction. It's actually external rotation and plantar flexion. That's inversion of the foot. Those three movements are on three different axes. So we have adduction like that. The foot goes more medial. We have external rotation and plantar flexion. Those are three movements of inversion. So let's say we get an ankle sprain. We get an inversion ankle sprain. Well, this can cause many different dysfunctions up through the body because of the subtalar joint and its relationship to, of course, many bones. We can talk about bones. We can talk about muscle and fascia. So I'm kind of grouping it all together, but we'll see it more so because it's connection with the lateral fascial chain of the body. Now, of course, you can have a subtalar joint lesion. You can have a compaction there. You could have uh, an injury there, a trauma, and it can actually affect the cervical spine because of its relationship with the cervical spine. It can affect the foot, the knee, and so forth. But uh, we're talking about more of a fascial connection here. So as it goes up, it can actually pull down on the fibula because of the fibula's relationship with the, cal the calcaneus and the talus, which can actually put tension on the IT band. Now, while this happens, what we'll typically see is you'll see your innominate bone. Now, this is your innominate bone. This is your right hip bone in a sense, the hip bone will actually be pulled anterior like this, anterior rotation, and an out flare. Now when this happens, a lot of people have IT band syndrome, knee pain, swelling, patella tracking issues, etc., ankle issues, restriction and dorsiflexion. But anytime we get that position, we're going to get a locking mechanism there just to kind of uh, generalize it. So we're going to get an increased anterior rotation on the site of the subtalar lesion, and on the other side, we're going to have the opposite effect. Now, this is actually going to affect the sacrum because now we're affecting the short arm and the long arm of the sacrum. And typically what you'll see is the sacrum will side bend to the same side of the iliac lesion or that anterior rotation and rotate to the opposite side. 
So if it was on the right side, it would actually side bend to the right and rotate to the left around the oblique axis. Now, it could be the left oblique axis, could be the right oblique axis. I don't want to get into that. But the bottom line is you'll get a torsion, a side bending and rotation in the sacrum itself. Now, at the same time as you go up the spine, you'll actually get a concomitant side bending and rotation to the same side of the lumbosacral junction. So you see a lot of people actually have iliosacral issues, sacroiliac issues. You'll see people have lumbosacral issues, maybe dyspathologies, degeneration, iliolumbar ligament tension, so even sacrotuberous ligament tension. And they'll typically have pain on that same side. Now, it's not always on the same side, but I'm just showing you how an ankle issue can cause a fibular issue, IT band pain, affect the ilium, affect the sacrum, cause lumbosacral issues, and of course that's going to create a concomitant torsion up the lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and cervical spine. Now I don't want to go to, into the intricacies of that, but the bottom line is this, if we start to see these torsions going on, what we'll typically see according to Magoon is the side that the um, sacrum actually side bends to, so if this is your sacrum, it's going to side bend, you'll actually see the base on one side higher and the base on the other side lower. Same thing if it rotates. This base is going to be anterior, this base is going to be posterior, but this base is actually higher. And what you'll see in the cranium, this is your occiput and this is your sphenoid, is the same side, and this is according to Magoon, that the base is actually high. You'll actually see in the occiput, the occiput will be pulled down low on the side of the high base. And that creates a lot of dural tension up the actual spine itself. Now it goes a lot deeper than that. A lot of people will actually have pain or tension when they flex forward. Same thing with the head, a lot of tension, they can have migraines. So what you'll typically see is on the high side of the sacral base, you'll see a low occiput. And that actually creates a side bend rotation in the occiput and sphenoid, which actually affects the cranial diaphragm from the tentorum cerebelli, falx cerebelli, falx cerebellum, to alter the pelvic diaphragm and how it, it actually correlates with the thoracic diaphragm, or I should say cranial diaphragm, how it actually relates to the thoracic diaphragm, pelvic diaphragm, and the diaphragm of the foot. So you actually have a diaphragm in your foot, so if the diaphragm of the foot is affected, you'll see concomitant issues in all three other diaphragms. At the same time, what you'll see more often is the iliac bone, like I showed you, right, it actually anteriorly rotates, it posteriorly rotates along an axis, it outflares and inflares, and it'll actually abduct, adduct and abduct around different axes. Well, your temporal bone in the side of your head, right here, or just stick your fingers in your ear, has the same axes as your ilium and actually does the same exact movements. Now, of course, in the occiput and the sphenoid, if we're getting a side bend, right, or I should say a, a side bend rotation in the... Um, the sphenoid in the occiput because of this subtalar lesion will actually see concomitant issues because of its relationship with the temporal um, in the OM suture. You'll actually see concomitant issues in the temporal bone. And the temporal bone, just to generalize, it might do the same thing, it might not. But if this ilium is actually anteriorly rotated and outflared and abducted, the temporal bone would do the same thing. The temporal, bo te pen, uh, temporal bone will anteriorly rotate, outflare, and abduct. So you'll start to see people have so many different cognitive issues, sometimes tension headaches, uh, tinnitus, issues in the jaw, they'll have a lot of cervical issues, thoracic issues, respiratory issues, they'll have lumbar pain, sacroiliac issues, iliosacral issues, leg length discrepancies, IT band syndrome, and so forth, all because of this ankle sprain. So hopefully I didn't lose you with this. Of course, it's a YouTube clip. You've got to do more research on this to learn more about it. You can study the work at Kapanji. You can study the work of Magoon. You can study the work of Upledger if you want. Guy Voyer. You can study a lot of different osteopathic people like A.T. Still, Philip Durell. Um, um, uh, who else? I'm drawing a blank here. Um, so anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this clip. Tune in for more, and I'm out of here.